Good afternoon, everybody. Jordan Goodfellow, Gig Ready here. Uh, we've got a very exciting episode today. We're talking about hybrid events and all the things that are involved and surrounded with it. But before we dive in, let me remind you, checking out Gig Ready Podcast, the one thing we ask, we're not going to advertise to you. We're not going to tell you anything that you should buy other than how to be a better professional. And our goal is just that. So give us a like, subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or any one of the other podcast apps you use, and uh, we'll make sure to give you guys all the best information possible, getting the information from the people that have it to the people that need it. This is the Gig Ready Podcast. <laughs> And we're back with four of my favorite meeting planners in the entire world. They were kind enough to return for round two. Somehow they're putting up with my wonderful, lovable personality. Sarah, Lynn, Tiffany, Lynn, and also Joe Mack is here to give us some color for the day. Joe, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having me back. <laughs> Welcome, ladies. Ladies, thank you so much. Glad to have you here. We're going to dive right in talking about hybrid Um Everybody's been doing virtual for, gosh, 12 months now. We talked about virtual last week, and now we are moving into the world of in-person and not in-person all at the same time. Um, do you guys feel like your clients are ready for hybrid? They're kind of itching. They're like, all right, we got to do something. We've got to like – we're tired of looking at computer screens all day long. Um, and this is Sarah. So I think my clients, I don't think anyone's excited about it per se. I think they've been hearing a lot about it. They know that it's an option and they want to be prepared with it if that's what they need to do. So, you know, everybody wants to get back to face to face meetings, but having the option to add the hybrid component to it, you know, to take care of people who either can't travel, don't feel comfortable traveling when everything else opens up, I think is, is the way that everyone's kind of getting prepared for it. Got it. Lynn, you were going to say we something? Had some clients, we had some clients last night who saw the Grammys and popped up today on calls and were like, that looks really good. Could we do that? So I think seeing it as an example is going to be important for people. We're also getting some sticker shock questions for people that we've submitted the proposals for the fall events and they're coming back going, why is it, you know, percentage of what it was last year? And I keep explaining it's two events. Yeah. Very, very. Hey, I agree with you. Um, Tiffany here. Um, Lynn, I agree with you. People want to see it first. Um, so for me and our team, we, I, I'll just say it, we kind of are excited to move into hybrid. Um, obviously, with the safety precautions, but um, to your point, yeah, virtual is getting a little bit uh, mundane. So, you know, nothing that we're doing right now, we're looking into more of a, the fall at earliest, but really looking into moving into hybrid. But what I was going to make a point about is that just like anything else, still wanna see what other people are doing first. No one wants to really jump in and be the first to do it. So it's gonna be interesting in the next couple of months, who's doing it and who's not. Interesting. Lots. Yeah, Joe. As we're as we're uh, transitioning into uh, hybrid events versus completely virtual events, um, how are you defining to your clients uh, the the um, what a hybrid event is? I can happy to jump in on that. You know, <clears throat> I think that it's interesting. This is Lynn, the other Lynn, <laughs> on, on Lynn this with podcast. Two ends. Yeah, the two end, Lynn. Um, it was interesting. We had an event uh, Friday that was the same event that a year ago we took it from live to virtual in three days. And we, our team was looking at each other and we're like, it's almost like we've got this figured out. <laughs> you know, we were laughing at the full circle moment. And um, there was a lot of comment in the chat around, we will we will continue to attend virtually. This is just, it just works. We've got it figured out. So I think that um, one of the things that we're doing, and I, I'm so glad, Lynn, that you mentioned the Grammys because I found, I took away so many best practices and really cool things about that last night. And um, 
we're starting floor plans for an event in November that is hybrid in nature. So we're, we're starting, what does it actually look like? You know, a, a, a concept deck with like, this is the experience that people would, would have on site. And this is the virtual experience. And this is where they intersect. And um, this is where there's unique offerings for each of the two audience. And I, I really, as people are saying, you know, two different events, it's, that's a sticky point for me because I keep thinking it's one event. The event is your product. You have two segments of customers. So I, I, I'm concerned about people, you know, really distinguishing these two things as separate experiences when I think we should be focused on one event, which is your product and two different types of customer or user. That's a really good point. This is the other Lynn. I, I, I think that's that's spot on. I, you know, but one interesting point that came up this week was, you know, hybrid events used to be defined as a live event with a virtual component, and now it's flipped. Really, it's a virtual event with a live component. So it's just, you know, the experience is a one experience, but sort of thinking through it with two different streams of thought is is important as well. I think that regardless of... I, I love the idea of not thinking of it as two separate events. And I think that people jump to that when they're talking about the budget, when we're trying to explain why it is so expensive, because we're saying you're basically paying for two events, but we have to stress that it's two events in one. It really is that one event. You have yeah. your virtual attendees and you have your on-site attendees, or if you're doing just your speakers on site, or if you're doing hub and spoke and you have different groups in, in different places, but the the budget has to go towards the virtual component of it and the in real life components of it and also the third part which is the production that kind of bridges those two together but it really is just one event um, i actually know of a couple of options i think it's wonderful that the grammys did this because people can see it as an option of oh this could actually work it's not something that's so scary um, and I think we've seen in the past, in the pandemic, some good examples and some bad examples. And I think everyone's been able to kind of take, you know, some some notes from those. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that that you know we need to take into account the budget. I, I'm having the same thing with my clients getting sticker shock. Um, but it's it's something that is a positive. It's something that is a new option that you can add to your event. I don't think people have to think of it as we have to have a, a hybrid event. They can think of it as, hey, listen, maybe we wouldn't have gotten these attendees to, to attend if they couldn't attend virtually or if they couldn't attend in person. Now we get to do both. Well, I think that's the, that's the sell to the, to the client is that you're, you're expanding your reach. If you turn it into a hybrid event, you can add more uh, consumers on the other end to attend the event, even if they don't necessarily contract, they can't travel or they can't fly or, you know, uh, afford to, to come. So you're, that's going to be the best way to sell that from a budget standpoint. What? Yeah. Joe, I just wanted to, um, cause you made a, a, a good point when you talked about what does that look like? And I think defining what hybrid and virtual events mean to, to clients and customers, because People don't want to feel like they're missing out. Oh, I can't attend, you know, the live event. So if I attend a virtual, am I missing out on the benefits of this hybrid? So I, regardless of what it is, I think defining a hybrid, and I think for any event, it will be different. Um, but defining that when you start to promote the event and let people know um, what actually that hybrid event looks like, I think that's important. So if, if, for events like like external, let's call them external versus internal, because we all do we do both. Um, you know, on an external world, if it's a if it's a leveraging, hey, get more people in, and and hybrid makes sense. What about meetings that is only of an internal nature, sales meetings, uh, places where it's only employees, and normally, so like for instance, I used to do a bunch of work with uh, a vaccine maker. And they would bring all of their employees in the U.S. to one place two times a year for their POA. And they would, you know, they were all there. So do you think that you see events like those becoming hybrid or do they just stay all virtual completely? Why even bring people into the same place for a day and a half when you may not necessarily get the same effect? So double the cost of the of the event, but yet only get half the people there. And then I've got to broadcast it anyways. I think there's a there's a lot of benefits that you get out of the the virtual or the hybrid component. 
um, of the meeting. There is, you know, obviously if you're going to be recording your assets and you can use them, you know, as, as continued archived, um, you know, footage, you can use them in other ways, repurpose them throughout the year to be able to either uh, do further trainings. If you're thinking of like an internal sales meeting or an internal training meeting, you can, you know, use that footage again to train in the future. You can get a lot of, you can kind of get a lot for your money for what you're doing. And what they're saving on flights, they're saving on time out of the office, they're saving on food and beverage, on you know transportation costs, it does offset it to a point. Um, and I think with internal events, you know, I have a lot of corporate clients who right now they they don't want to do in-person events because of just the liability. Whereas if it's an external event, people kind of have the opportunity or they have the choice whether or not to attend. So I think having the high, the hybrid component takes away some of that liability because you're basically giving your people the option of whether or not they want to attend in person or you know virtually but i think just like tiffany said you really have to you can't think of your virtual attendees as an afterthought you have to set expectations of what is going to be included and what's going to be expected of both audiences and make sure that the experience is just as worthwhile for the virtual audience as for the on-site audience yeah what? Go ahead, Lynn. Oh, I was going to say, I think she makes a good point about business travel. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how large companies sort of decide to, to work their uh, employee meetings. And I could see doing something like virtually every other year and in person every other year to sort of split those costs now that they've saved all that money this year and things have been running well. I mean, what you're really missing out, obviously, is your networking and your, your team bonding. But perhaps if you could combine that, you know, with a virtual experience, you know, I could see costs going down and people moving to a model like that. Yes, sir. Sorry, yes, sir. really quick, just look at what happened with work from home. How many companies had said, there's no way our people can work from home. We'll be losing so much productivity. And then pandemic happened. Everyone had to be had to work from home. And now they're saying, you know what? Maybe we don't need to have people come back to the office. Look how much we're saving on rent. Look how much we're saving on, you know, coffee. So now they're saying, oh, maybe we'll have 10% of the workforce or one day a week in the office. So they're kind of shifting their thinking and it, it's the same exact thing when it comes to virtual and in-person meetings. Maybe they don't have to have everyone come on site to be able to get the same benefits. I was going to bring that up as well. When you're talking about internal events, um, evaluating what your policies are going forward. Or what are the work from home policies? And then what is everyone's comfort level? Um, so when you evaluate where people are coming back to the office, there are going to be some people that are like, OK, how can we get together on a smaller scale? So I still think that hybrid is going to be a, a viable source, but at the same time, I think, you know, having having a choice, especially you know, if you're talking about internal events with your employees, I don't think you want to single out people that aren't ready to come back to work or in person, and still having that option where it's not placed on them, where you know, on their, their comfort level. So having that hybrid option, as, as far as um, internal meetings, I think will still be important. I also, this is Lynn, I think that um, we did an event for Boeing recently and they had a speaker on there and they talked about business travel and their projection was that business travel wouldn't be back fully until 2024. And that number, when they said it, I was like, that seems so far away, but they made a great point where, you know, people are going to stay put for a while until that first salesperson goes out and, and books a new gig or takes business because they got on a plane to do it. Then, you know, for sales teams, then they're going to be like, everybody get on a plane, you know? <laughs> so I thought that was a, a great perspective. But the other thing that comes to mind around an internal meeting is the opportunity. If you think about the Grammys last night, how they basically swapped out the, the live audience um, during the performances. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but they had, the category nominees come in while the performances were going on. And so there was almost essentially a new audience every after every performance segment. And, you know, so maybe there's an opportunity again to reinvent this and say, okay, um, new hires could be there that morning at the Arizona resort. And then, you know, top leadership comes in that night and has the same smaller intimate experience. And then, you know, top customers come in the next day and, you know, all weaving this kind of live experience into sub segments of your attendees. 
and having them kind of swap the, the live setting. But then again, the whole show is broadcast. I don't know. I, I was thinking of that last night as I watched it. Mm-hmm. What a cool concept to take your audience and kind of segment them out and have them have different experiences and opportunities to connect live. So then I'm going to, I'm actually going to skip a few questions here and move right to the, right to the costs side of things. Cause I mean, that really is the biggest the biggest factor in all of this, I mean, from a cost standpoint, um, normally, you know, you have your buckets for your your hotel, food and beverage, you know, room, all of that sort of stuff, then production costs, travel costs, and so on. You know, all of those are in play now. Everything's going to move around. And um, what are you guys seeing from a standpoint of costs Where's it coming from? Where's it going to? And how much are they having to add a percentage? Are they taking a percentage away? Like what, where are you guys? Is it all over the board? I have no, I really honestly have no idea because I don't see what you guys see on a daily basis. Well, you said, you know, this is the main point and yes and no, because there are some ways that a hybrid event can be very expensive, but there are some ways where just a normal in-person event can be very expensive. There are ways to do things cheaply. And I think the, the, the issue comes from people's expectations of what things should cost. It's not that it costs so much. It's that people think, oh, well, we're doing it on Zoom. This part should be free. It should be half the price because only half the people are there. And that's kind of what the mindset that leads them to get that sticker shock. Because if you had a, a live event with large production and you know everyone on site and you're paying for food and beverage and hotel and transportation, it's gonna be a high cost. and just you know, taking half the people out there, yes, you take away half of those costs. But if you are then integrating either the mobile platform, um, you know, the I'm sorry, the virtual platform and the production and kind of the interface between the two, it's not that much of difference. If you're going from something very inexpensive and having to add the production to create the virtual part of it, then that's where I think the cost comes in. And that's where it makes a difference. But you can look at it as it's still an opportunity. If this is an internal event, obviously, if it's not going to be a, you know, if attendees are not paying, then that's not really something that you can use to kind of leverage it. But if this is a, a paid event, you can expand your reach. The great thing about virtual, we said last week, is that it's infinitely scalable. You don't need to add more hotel rooms. You don't need to add, you know, more, more, more space. You can scale it. So, pricing it in a way that encourages you to be able to grow this audience that doesn't really add anything to your costs really can help to to kind of outlay any cost that you're putting out. This is Lynn, but it's also a, a you know, just the, the value to sponsors. I mean, just the, the, the larger audience in general, even if it's not a paid event, a lot of times it's worth it just having a virtual component just to increase that those audience viewers numbers for your sponsors. Um, our costs generally, I mean, like you said, it's a, like a virtual event. It can be all over the place, depending on the bells and whistles. If we've got moving versus stationary cameras, the whole nine yards, but typically taking travel out of it, it's coming in about a quarter, 25% more to add on another director, another technical producer, you know, that's sort of the, the, the basic levels we need. Got it. So. So in your experience so far, you're seeing like a 25% overall cost increase only in production or in the total cost of the event. Did you catch me? No, sorry. It cut out. Um, no, apologies. No I said, are you seeing a 20, is it a 25% increase in production costs alone or the total, like, you know, looking at the whole event, the whole big bowl of wax? Um, there's some overlapping areas, but the whole big ball of wax for us, for just a basic stream and, you know, a live event is coming in about 25% more. Got I mean, that's a, that's a generalization based on sort of eight projections of events. We haven't done many of them, but that's sort of the number I have yeah. in my head that keeps popping up. I want exact figures to the penny, Lynn. Come on. That's what we're looking for here. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's talk hotels real quick. I've noticed that hotels have started to add in, you know, they've got all of these, you know, newfangled emails that I'm getting all the time about. We've got all these hybrid plans and all this hybrid stuff and all these things, and it's all interconnected and it's going to be awesome. 
Um, do you guys feel like that is ready and they're actually presenting that in a way that, you know, it's going to help actually keep costs under control? Because we know, th- I mean, virtual can just run. I mean, if it just starts going, you start adding people, you start adding bandwidth, you start adding registrations. I mean, all of that can happen. Uh, where um, where do the hotels fall into all of this? And are Do we think that they're effectively promoting the idea that we can really keep these costs under control as they as it grows Sarah's what's interesting space. about um hotels and venues in, in general is they're going to be it's going to be now a more competitive market because i know we're going to reach out to venues that are on top of it that we feel supported so it's going to be um interesting to see the previous venues that we've used or hotels that we've used and what they've done and if they ha- if they're not there yet um going to someone who has, you know, all the capabilities to run a hybrid event. So I personally am curious and interested in like the, the venues that we are going to start looking into and really diving into. Um, those are going to be the ones that are the ones that are on top of it already and promoting. For me, I haven't seen a whole lot of, um, in ladies, I don't know if you've had a lot of um, venues reach out and promote about their um, capabilities, but I right now haven't seen that. So I'm hoping it's, it's soon. <laughs> so. It makes me nervous just speaking to Lynn's point last week about how we build our teams. And we've gone through battle with our production partners this past year, moving over to a hotel virtual team makes me nervous <laughs> because I don't want to go into battle with people that I haven't done events with. Yeah. Well, and I would say to that end, Lynn, you know, uh, we do some training with hotels and I'll tell you, they're, they're not quite ready. And it's unfortunate because I feel like they could have taken that off season last year and really gotten up to speed. And, and unfortunately, so many of them were, you know, uh, furloughed or that they weren't engaged in that. Now they're coming back and it's kind of like, we're ready now. We need just, I was asking for floor plans the other day for, you know, a hybrid or a social distance kind of set and they didn't have any of those ready yet. And so it's like, we're, we're ready. Like we're, we're going to go a couple points about the hotels. I think one hotel I'm working with right now is doing an incredible job of arming us with marketing material about how safe it is to be in their venue and not just like a punch list, but like the marketing language that we need to put our attendees at ease, which is impressive. Secondly, I think that um, connectivity is going to be a huge issue because it'd be, it was one thing when you were, you know, a thousand people in a ballroom and then the Wi-Fi stuttered a bit and people couldn't check their email for 30 minutes. And then they got ramped back up to speed, one big pipeline in and just, you know, five different groups using it. Um, again, I hope that they've spent some time investing in their infrastructure because it's that's just not a, it's not going to be okay to be sorry they can't get their email where you know one of your vendors is pulling some bandwidth and you know we we're going to need to have some um, real reassurance that that the connectivity is strong and can support what's happening in their building as well as what's happening um, online. And then the other thing I would say is a lot of the hotels are working with us to negotiate a studio in as part of our space rental and having them anticipate, we understand that you're here and we're tending to your folks in the ballroom, but that you're also here conducting a full blown, you know, you need a production war room to, to handle these audience members that are everywhere. So I think those hotels, hoteliers that are on top of understanding that maybe they're negotiating that in, maybe they're, you know, working with us on the price of, of Wi-Fi to get us back in their building. Maybe they're working with us to offer that studio. Those are just some things that I, relative to having been a hotelier for a lot of years, I hope these salespeople are really anticipating our needs. Lynn, can you imagine what they're going to charge us for internet going forward? It was already oh. before. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Well, and that's where that. I, they want us back so bad though. That's where I've been hearing that, you know, while, while you were gone, we built a studio. We did invest in infrastructure. We, and we have what you need because we wanted you to come and do a broadcast from here live. So now when you come back live, we also have this other, I mean, for us, I found three different hotels that built out pretty elaborate studios that are going to be awesome to use those while we have people sitting in the ballroom and for the people that are joining virtually. Yes, to both of the Lynns, I'm so glad that you both mentioned the the connectivity and the internet. Definitely, you have to worry about 
upload speeds as well as download speeds because a lot of times when your attendees are just in the ballroom, they're just downloading. But when you're streaming, that upload has to be yeah. on. And we recommend to have a dedicated network and to have hard lines for the, the production team. And obviously, you know, you usually have one or two in the ballroom, but this is, let's say you're going to have a lot of breakouts. You need a hard line in each of those. Uh, yeah. We're dealing with hotels right now and the hotels want to have, uh, for example, some of the hotels will allow us to bring our production team in for the general session but the hotel has to manage anything that's a breakout. How does that work with a virtual program? Because if the, or I'm sorry, a hybrid program, if the breakouts are also going to be streamed out and those are going to be interactive programs with the virtual attendees, we need to have our production company you know, running all of that. So those are these conversations that I don't think anyone was really ready to have. Um, I know, you know, you asked about different hotels and what they're offering. I have seen a lot of these studios being built, you know, green screen. We have, um, you know, different different formats, all the video cameras. I think some of them are kind of ramping up and it's really exciting. Um, I know that we had a meeting with Hyatt Hotels a couple weeks ago and they have a new kind of hub and spoke program that they're promoting where they have a number of their properties uh, I think it's domestic right now, but it may be worldwide eventually where they will, if you want to have kind of these smaller regional meetings, but all connected together, then they will cover the, or they will include the audiovisual and the production that connects them. And they use different kinds of cameras and things, um, obviously, you know, for smaller meetings, and then you can, you can scale up as you need to. But I think hotels are trying to be creative, which I think is wonderful. Um, you know, that's how they've survived for so many years, but um, the you know the production is is uh, you know it's always an issue when you're trying to to bring in your own team and the hotel wants to kind of own certain pieces. And I think the hotels need to have a technical expert on staff. Yeah. I mean, it's almost as critical as having a catering manager. You know, they need to have a technology manager that understands the nuances of this hybrid um, needs. I, I, I'm hope I'm hopeful that they're making that investment in people who have spent some time in production, you know, that really understand the virtual components. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I know with my clients, um, they often have their go-to hotels and their, their venues that <clears throat> they attend, you know, hundreds of events at year after year after year. Um, but if they, if they don't, have the connectivity and they don't have those those things those important options that you're looking for for a hybrid event i'm wondering if this if there's an untapped market for vendors like a wi-fi provider just like just like Something. you would rent a generator for uh for uh, an event that needs a lot of power for lighting and audio and stuff so i'm wondering if there's if there's a, an untapped market for somebody like that to to step up into the playing field I think there definitely is. We actually work with a vendor who brings in hotspots and is able to provide that Wi-Fi. Uh, one of the benefits is in case there is an issue with the with the internet, they're actually the ones who are controlling it. So it's not like you have to call Comcast or you have to call you know FiOS to see if they can kind of flip a switch to give you more bandwidth. Um, the problem is a lot of hotels will fight against you being able to bring that. Um, you know. We all know that internet is one of the highest uh, margins. You know, it's 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 the the costs are very are very good for the hotels. Um, technically, I believe there's a law that prevents hotels from blocking any Wi-Fi signals, at least within the U.S. It's not necessarily the same internationally. So we should be able to bring in our own Wi-Fi, but again, that's something that, you know, whoever is sourcing or your sourcing partner would have to negotiate that with the hotel. And that's part of this whole conversation that we're now having. Yeah, very much so. Cool. I, I, and you're right. Yeah. There was a whole bunch of lawsuits against Marriott. I'm going to I'm just going to call them out because they were blocking stuff a number of years ago that got, you know, they got struck down saying you can't do that because um, you're blocking a utility at that point. In fact, they were I think they were caught blocking cell phone service specifically at that point because people were working to use their own devices. Um, so that creates an interesting scenario. I do have one friend who runs a bunch of studios out of Chicago that they have this technology where, in fact, if they can't get the speed out of the hotel, they can put a microwave transmitter on the roof, and they actually, within 50 miles, can get 100 up and 100 down, like, reliably without without even blinking an eye. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, 
I think this would drive the price down in the hotels because you're going to have, especially in, a, in an urban area, you can put a microwave transmitter on the top and for a thousand bucks, I can get a hundred up, hundred down, unlimited or whatever the cost is. It's not going to be the $10,000 for a 10 up, 10 down connection that may work. And we hope it does. And they'll give you 500 kilobits per person kind of thing. Like, um, <laughs> you know, in theory, it would drive competition, Am I wrong there? Or, I mean, are the hotels just going to try and pound it down our throats and say, here, you have to do this? And, again, I'm not trying to knock on hotels. I And I get, Sarah, what you said. Wi-Fi is, I mean, we're talking huge margins. Um, but at the same time, we have to be able to effectively do meetings. But then they'll give you the chairs for free. <laughs> I think they're going to start by trying to trying to charge a, the, a fortune for it. And I hope, if anything this last year of virtual events has armed the, the the average planner with a little bit more technical knowledge to go in and push back a little bit more. Because I think the AV costs in hotels previously, people didn't understand them. So they were just accepting them for what they were. And I, I hope that we'll be able to sort of ask more questions and push back a lot harder as, a, as an industry than we previously have been. Because the, the, the scope in the hotels and the cost structure in the hotels just got out of hand because it could, because people, we allowed them to do that in a sense without, because we didn't push back along the way. What, uh, so you mentioned that Lynn, that's a great point. Um, give me a couple of those things. Like what are some things that we should be thinking about? Um, I always got super frustrated with, you know, hotels for getting clients into contracts that just like, there was no, they never redlined anything. They never, like, they just signed on the dotted line and boom, you know, okay, now you're stuck. And then we go back and try and do production and things like that. And I say, I need 20 down. And they're like, oh, that's $50,000. What are some things that people can be thinking about now? Okay, here's the information we need to make sure we have on hand when we go to sign a contract and we're looking at these things about Wi-Fi, you know, so that we can actually negotiate that. I think people definitely need to be more knowledgeable about, you know, when they're going into the contract. And I think if anything, during this past year, what I've seen is people taking courses, they've been, to, you know, taking taking advantage of the kind of free time that they were forced to have to be able to educate themselves a little more and also reaching out to, you know, to third parties. The reason why my clients use me is because I spend my time learning what I need, you know, what they deserve in their contracts and what they what questions they should really be asking. So definitely need to ask about about um, internet speed, internet you know, reliability, um, whether or not that counts for just the general session or the, um, the breakouts as well, um, whether or not you can bring in your own production team and there's going to be shadow fees. Um, do they have the capability to stream to the sleeping rooms? Because that is another hybrid, uh, you know, hybrid opportunity where if you can't have everyone in the, you know a large general session you have some small breakouts but then you have the keynote stream to their sleeping rooms um you know there's lots of different options that people may not know exist and they may not know to ask for and i do agree i think now things are going to be expensive and i think you know we all want hotels to make money you know because we want hotels to stay in business so then we can keep doing our jobs but we want people to be um, educated consumers and educated planners and um, I think now, you know, people have more that they need to know about, which is kind of scary, but there's definitely resources out there to, you know, to kind of help with that. So what are some things I should know? I'm walking into a hotel to book, I, and, and, you know, and they tell me it's $10,000 for 10 up, 10 down. Um, I, I could all say all day long, I think that's ridiculous. And they're just going to look at me and say, well, that's the price, you know, take it or leave it. What are some things that we that, that we could say to them? And, and this is me genuinely asking because I'm always the guy that's like talking to to now Encore saying, why does it cost this? And they can never, you know, the technician, the guy in the room, he can't explain it to me. He's like, I don't know. Um, what are some what are some things we could actually say to say, OK, this is going to get it when it gets out of control to say this is out of control? Well, just like Joe mentioned, there's definitely it does exist the ability to bring in Wi-Fi from an outside vendor. It's not just production and it's not just AV. Uh, it You can bring in Wi-Fi and you can bring in hotspots. And at least domestically within the US, it's against the law for them to, uh, to block the signal. You do have to negotiate with the hotels and some hotels will not allow you to bring in your own, but that brings up the point where 
when you're negotiating with hotels, you have to say, this hotel will let me do this. This hotel won't. If Is that a deal breaker for me? And if so, is that a deal breaker for the hotel? I'm not going to use this hotel unless you allow me to, you know, to bring it in. You have to know, you know, be able to compare. And I think obviously things are going to be a little bit more expensive at the beginning. But as hotels start investing in these, um, you know, these studios and the different the infrastructure that they have, hopefully the price will go down and then people won't have to kind of play this game anymore or yeah. as much. Two points from here. I always. I also think you need to. Oh, no, that's okay, Lynn, you go ahead. Go ahead. I also think that as a planner, you need to know your numbers, like forwards, backwards, up, down, sideways, you, you know, like any business owner for this is your, your business, this particular event. And you need to know, you know, um, like the value of your event, Jordan, when you say, what do you need to know? And they start saying, we're going to hold the line on $10,000, you know, to be able to say, so we, my, my events, you know, $1.2 million and you're going to walk away for 10 grand from your AV vendor. Like those kinds of conversations of really knowing, you know, or being able to say, so what you're telling me is with, you know, a hundred people, my people are paying $200 a person to have Wi-Fi. Does that, does that it make sense to you? How can I sell that? My virtual people have paid $49 for a ticket to, to log on for a few hours. Now you're telling me I have to pay $200 per person more. That's, I'm never going to be able to sell that. So I yeah. think sometimes breaking down those costs and kind of understanding, um, and again, from a hotel salesperson, you want to lose a million dollar piece of business because of 10 grand from your vendor, they should be able to put some, you know, pressure or have a conversation with the AV vendor to say, this is one piece of the puzzle, you know, and it's, and it's exorbitant. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to prevent us from having business, not only this one, but others. So I just, I think there's times when I get in negotiations with venues, when you start talking about that, like, tell me how I would add $200 to my virtual ticket to cover the cost you just told me, you know, or I've also, I've paid 2000 for Wi-Fi somewhere and then $25,000 bid for the same exact Wi-Fi and show them that proposal, not who, but show them that and go, do you understand this is a marketplace and that we have options and that. You know, and Sarah's laughing. I can see your face, Sarah. About just that's that's how I negotiate. You gotta you gotta break it down into nuggets they can understand, and that makes common sense. Because again, we want them to make money. They're our partners. We're not unreasonable. We also just have to work within the confines of you know what people are willing to pay to, to be there and what is a reasonable cost for production. I think, um, and with having that information available to you and itemized. I mean, because what before this we have, like you said, AV. This is the price, but now it's like that breakdown because now if I know that that Wi-Fi is two hundred dollars a person, <laughs> you know what I mean. There's a lot of room to really negotiate and find out to the nickel <laughs> what everything is cost within that AV cost. And yeah. I think before we didn't really do that, you know, we just accepted that. But now, if it's just Wi-Fi as a component, and then what else, you know, what what parts of the production can we negotiate? So having that that information broken down, I think, will be handy. And honestly, Jordan, um, I think every planner on here knows you have to negotiate, you know, and not accept the, the final, you know, number um, and being able to know where you can negotiate for pricing. So, yeah, I inherit a lot of, um, of, of venue contracts, but I do try to coach my clients when they're negotiating for, for contracts to have it in there that that we can bring in outside vendors at no additional fee. That to me is the most like you could do whatever you want, as long as you have that line in there. Um, even if they have shadow fees, I don't mind those as much, as long as I can put them in my contracts, yeah. but then also have it cost out. So you know, what it would be to bring in that whole production team and you can compare it against what they're charging you in house. And just having that number usually gets them down to where you need them to be. Absolutely. I think the reason why hotels can charge so much for Wi-Fi is it's kind of an invisible commodity. You know, you see food, you can count the number of, you know, muffins and you can say, okay, I know X muffin and this is what a muffin is worth to me. But upload and download speed, a lot of times it, you know, goes over people's heads, um, I guess, physically and, <laughs> and emotionally. Um, and so that's why it, it, I think that's the thing that varies so much between hotels. A lot of hotels will throw that in as a bonus, you know, at free, everything in you know the general session or any of the meeting space is is absolutely included or they will upcharge it and you know that's kind of what they hold over you that you can't bring in outside you can't bring in um you know either outside production or or 
Wi-Fi. And so I think just people knowing that there are options and that they can compare prices and that they can, just like Lynn said, break it down, break it into chunks, you know, speak in, it, compare it to per person. If it makes it sound ridiculous, it probably is. I think also if you come in with a, a real specific uh, ask of, of connectivity, whether it's, you know, 100 up, 100 down or 10 up, 10 up, down, if you come in with that and they can't deliver, then you have the right to go to an outside vendor. Right, yeah. I would agree. And I think too, Joe, one of the things I wanna point out is the tech support. You know, when we started doing virtual, I would say to these new virtual uh, platforms, tell me about your support day of, you know, leading up to, tell me about the, you know, resolution scenario planning of this, if this breaks. I, I think that we're gonna have that same scenario happening in, in hotels when we decide to get more bandwidth to be able to do virtual and live together. I wanna know that I've got a, really savvy technician that that lives in that hotel you know we had an event at a large brand with a thousand tech people and even the you know this was fully live no virtual but even that broke and the support was you know in two time zones away and I wanted to see the dashboard I wanted to see what kind of speeds we were up against I was asking all these questions and I literally had like a frontline AV guy that started two days prior so it was really frustrating. And when you have a, your entire show go down because of a hotel Wi-Fi, you better have a solid plan of resolution and tech support. And I think that's going to be super critical. Tell me who I got in the saddle with me day of show. I want to know the banquet captain in case we run out of chicken. I want that same relationship with the technical person on your team that I feel comfortable could, could problem solve. I agree. And, that, and that's a great point. So then that begs the question. As meeting planners, do you guys start to employ your own IT professional that comes in with you every single time? So for, I, my example is this. I, I did a lot of work with Microsoft over the last number of years. And no matter where we were in the world, we had a team of four or five IT only people that their entire job was to make sure that the entire venue was wired, set ready to go and was rock solid. And even with them, we would have issues from time to time in certain countries. So do you carry, like, do you basically have your own person that rolls in with you as an independent source, independent of the venue that says, listen, you guys are telling me this is a hundred by a hundred and I cannot get more than 50 by 50. There's something bottlenecking us here. We need to figure it out. Jordan, did we ever work on a Microsoft event together and not know it? I, we may <laughs> I, have. I, I was I've spent a decade with that. And you're right. They bring their own teams. And I would say yes to what you're saying. My, my two cents is absolutely an independent technology and platform expert that can say this is going to work in this venue. We're going to be able to deliver a great show externally from this from this actual bricks and mortar. Yeah. Well, I think if you can bring that, that's great. I don't think that everyone has the the budget to be able to employ someone full time to come with them to all their meeting just for IT. Listen, that would be incredible. Um, I think, you know, even just the basics of I'm not an IT professional, but I know how to run a speed test on my phone. You know, I can run a speed test on my computer and I can point to it and I can say, this is the up and down that we were promised. And this is the up and down that we're getting. Look, the, you know, it's right here. And that a lot of times will, you know, kind of put a fire under them to fix it. But just as important as knowing what's pro uh, promised is knowing what they will do to mitigate or to fix it when it doesn't work or if it doesn't work. So just like Lynn was saying, you know, who's the person that I talk to? What are the steps that are going to be taken if it doesn't work? How long is it going to take? How is it going to be off? You know, what are the backups? Um, you know, so these are all the important questions. Just like you would ask for food and beverage, you need to have those questions now for, you know, to make sure that your hybrid meeting is, is, is going as well. Because again, the virtual attendees cannot be an afterthought. They are just as important an audience as your on-site attendees. It's and and a technical director, technical person ha, ha, has always been a part of, of the way we do business. So I always like even without the virtual component, like to have a person that speaks that language on site at every show to make sure we're not missing something because I, I didn't want them to sort of speak to me and me not to be able to understand it. So we carry that person. Now I see that being expanded with larger shows certainly, uh, and especially broadcast, like big broadcast, you certainly would have a full IT team. Yeah. But you know, 
if you can afford it, even a freelance, like just day of person to be there to help you sort of interface with the onsite team, I think is invaluable. Well, I definitely think the IT person, having someone on hand that's, you know, that represents you is important because that same uh, IT person on the venue, they're responsible for that venue. So, but we still have to test the speakers and making sure the camera is right and everything is presented okay. So you definitely have to have someone. Um, and it's interesting too, because, you know, we've done all these virtual events and now that we're including our, our actual IT department on the event, but we didn't do that before. You know what I mean? We, as the, the um, uh, meeting department, we never really had to include IT unless something was awry. Now they're involved in all our walkthroughs and our dry runs. And, you know, they, it, it seems like they're doing like double duty, you know, running IT as far as, you know, within the company, but then IT within um, an actual event as well. Yeah. Along those same lines, um, my cousin works in IT and he's actually calling me asking for event help because he's being, he's being tasked with actually running the events as the IT guy. So, so I've been, I've been giving him pointers and tips on how to, how to do these hybrid events without, with very little knowledge. Yeah. So it'll- well, it's interesting too, because it's sometimes it's not a, a, an additional person. It's like, oh, now we've added more workload to the IT department. So like right. you said, they're getting, now they're getting more event work when they, you know, before that wasn't their, one of their duties. So it's interesting that the work is, is doubling up on the IT department. Everything requires technology. Um, yes. And it's just going to get more inundated with it for sure. Um, so we've covered cost, people, personnel, who we need. What do you guys actually consider your options in the hybrid environment? Lynn, earlier you mentioned Hub and Spoke. Um, you know, different hotels have different ideas. But what do you guys see as, or, or I should say, how many different options do you feel you have? And then what do you think are the options you're going to rely on the most as a planner and as someone recommending stuff to your clients? Who wants to take it? I can can talk. (laughs) So I think there's, I mean, there's unlimited different, different options for hybrid. You know, there's uh, attendee hybrid where everyone is remote, you know, and and maybe there's a couple of people in, so there's there's full hybrid where you have a group of people on site in a hotel, and then you have a separate group of people who are going to be remote. There's speaker hybrid where the speakers are on site and the speakers are all together, but all the attendees are remote. There's hub and spoke where you have smaller groups of people who are kind of connected with the central you know, idea. Or there's the option of doing a, a hybrid event, a, a virtual event and a live event, but doing them at separate times. So you have basically, you're running the same event, you have the same speakers, you have a lot of the same content, but in order to facilitate you know, a direct communication, it's not pre-recorded, it's live, but it's live to both a virtual audience and a an in, in-person audience just at slightly separate times maybe the next day or the next week hmm. so there's so many different ways that you can think about it um, you just have to really take into account just like we were saying last week what are your goals who are your audience you know how, what are people's timelines like you know does it make sense to do if I'm doing an eight hour a day uh, virtual uh, uh, real life meeting does it make sense to have the online component be eight hours as well or is that not as much of a value so there's tons of options and you know you have to think about what the sessions are going to be like is it going to be interaction between the two audiences or is it going to be the virtual audience kind of doing their thing and the on-site audience doing their thing are are there going to be opportunities for one-to-one so i think those are some of the things that you can kind of play with to really to create the perfect um, program that fits your needs. And that hybrid audio and uh, audience engagement, I think is a, is an area where technology needs to be better so that we can engage our virtual and engage our live together to really well. I mean, right now it's just not perfect. Yeah. Lynn, I think it goes back to Jordan when, you know, when we were deciding you know, there was a live event structure when we were deciding to take it virtual. I think there had to be that high level goals set out, obviously in the strategies, but each element of the show needed to be evaluated to say, does this work in virtual? You know, and so I think that same exercise has to happen with your clients to be like, you know, what are the elements of your show and how does that best translate? Can we do that virtually? Can we do it live? Can we do it 
hybrid where we're, we're all experiencing it at the same time. You know, we've got a client that's doing one of their features they love is kind of a ask the speaker when they leave the stage. That's such a big thing. And people go to the stage and ask the speaker. So we're doing it live where people can do that. And then we're broadcasting that the speaker will be in a virtual room to do Q&A, ask the speaker after they leave the physical stage. So we're, we've got a studio set up and they're going from there to the studio to then do online meet the speaker. And the other part, one other element we're doing is um, in Atlanta, we're doing a mostly virtual and then we're having a huge party on a lawn out, outside and it's going to be after people have engaged all day in this really meaningful um, content that they're going to go to this party and it's got a huge open space and we think we can get a lot more people to come to the party portion of this whereas most of the day we believe they'll be online. So it just, I think you just have to take all of those elements and talk about whether they work in each to each audience and where do they work well together. Hmm. I like like we're planning a really cool question and answer wall inside of a ballroom with people coming in virtually to be able to engage them into Q and a in that, in that way, in a cool way. So there's just, there's so many opportunities, I think, to get creative and innovative around engagement. Yeah. Because you don't want either audience feeling like, oh, wait, you're, you're telling me I went to one breakout session and people online got to watch the video recording about 25 of, you know, all, all four breakouts at the same time on demand. Like you still have to make, we're really being clear about making sure everybody buys a virtual ticket and gets all the virtual stuff packaged up. And then those people are upgrading into that live event experience for the additional investment. Hmm. That's kind of what our approach we're taking. Wow. So that makes sense because that, that's more like a clear cut as, as an attendee. I know what I'm getting if I choose this, as opposed to feeling like you're missing out on something if you choose one or the other. So having that clear definition and that upgrade, I like that. So being able to say, you know, hey, I'm going to upgrade into this, I think will give um, a better impression on what to expect on the attendee side. Well, and it, we started talking about there was so so much uncertainty about when we could go live, right? When we could have a live element. And I just kept advising the clients, let's just assume everything is virtual and we will onboard and, you know, bring to the marketplace this a, ability to attend live when we all feel comfortable. And then we can talk about what that additional cost is, like upgrading at a concert to VIP or mm-hmm. upgrading when you ride a, buy your ticket to, you know, on a plane, and then you may want to upgrade to first class. We kind of are looking at it that way, that there's things in virtual you cannot do as well. And so that this live ticket holder is going to have that added value of this rich networking experience and different activities that face-to-face. So therefore it's an upgrade in their ticket price. And we do a lot of paid events. So it's a little different from you that have internal events. Internal, right. Yeah. Well, and then for us, just um, the biggest thing is the, the looking into the actual venue. I mean, before we would be like, you know, what's a trendy spot that we can have this? And now it's like, what are the capabilities of this venue? And I feel like, you know, going forward, we're going to use the same venues over and over again. Um, I say venues because sometimes we don't use hotels. Um, a lot of times we'll have um, annual events at a at a venue um, that people like, but I, I see that those venues are not, they're not gonna work for us going forward right now. They're, they don't have the capabilities for this hybrid program. So mm-hmm. what's in, gonna be interesting is doing the research and figuring out which of these venues are going to work for a a hybrid event. I mean, we're looking at right now, what are, what are our outside options? Like, how can we have an event outside? How can we have our technology outside? I don't know if that's going to work, but that's something that is that option out there. And so we're going to be researching and looking into hotels, venues, even creative spaces. And like you said, Joe, maybe a, a, an external, a company, maybe a production company that's now there in the venue space. So that's going to be interesting going forward. What that looks like. Yeah, I wonder if the AV companies are gonna are gonna have a an IT component that's specifically geared towards that. That way, they can they can do whatever they need to um, to do live streaming events. You know, I've companies heard like definitely Creative heard Technologies. Talk of that. Yeah, yeah, I Joe, I, I've heard mentions. Yeah, I think it's smart. I, I have, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, sorry. I was going to say two quick points. We just did an event on a side of a mountain with 20 speakers who came in from all over crazy parts of the world. 
And, you know, the techno technological needs for that were something I had never experienced before, but it works. And number two, Tiffany, don't give up on your independent venues because you bring in your own team yeah. and make it work and support those venues. Because we run three venues and I don't want to see everybody running to a hotel just because, you know, they make it easy. Yeah. I want the independent venues to, to continue to get the business if they can. Absolutely. And I think technology, I mean, if we really look at it, the technology has increased to a point now where we don't have to be stuck in hotels. I mean, truly, if you think about microwave technology, you think about Wi-Fi, you think about everything else. Um, and I say stuck in hotels. I don't, Sarah, I'm not trying to knock on, you know, not going to hotels, but at the same time, wireless technology, I mean, that really is the direction they're trying to push everything. Everything goes wireless, everything without wires. And so if we have technology that we can get the speeds and the reliability, which rel reliability is really the greatest portion of this, this would allow us to pick places that before were never actually viable because you couldn't get either enough people there or you weren't able to get the reliable technology to actually take the event to that place. And so um, it really opens things up, I think. Um, and Lynn, your independent venues, I believe, uh, could see a, actually a better, you know, a better outcome from this versus not so that we actually can create some really cool experiences for people. Yeah. What was interesting 100%. too is the um, the numbers are going to change. So a lot of these independent venues they couldn't accommodate us um, originally because we wanted you know a hundred person ballroom. But now we're not doing these hundred people um, events in ballrooms quite yet. So those independent venues that can do you know twenty or thirty people, I think they'll they'll get in and get good business because it's going to be a smaller event that they now are able to like put their bid in. So yeah. it'll be interesting. Going Sarah? back to your oh. technology. Oh, sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. You're good. Oh, going back to your uh, technology speak. I was, uh, I was actually just reading an article all about um, how VR goggles and uh, Facebook and Apple are all coming out with these products that are going to kind of change the way the consumer uh, attends events where they can go to a basketball game or they can go to a concert um, from their living room and, I think that's a that's an untapped market that we need to look at as event planners, where we can set up a virtual hub. People can mingle around as their avatar, or whatever, and and still uh, you know meet up, do breakouts. They can go into the breakout rooms and have those events. Um, so I think that that's an interesting uh, thing that we're we're just scratching the surface on. Well, I don't know if you saw last week, but Microsoft is putting a lot of money into holograms. To, to be able to pull the people into your space. So that's a different type of hybrid experience, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And Jordan, I definitely don't think that people are ever gonna stop going to hotels. I don't want them to. Uh, what I was saying is, you know, I mean, look at us, we're all in our homes. Who would have thought that years ago we'd be producing a, a podcast or producing a webinar out of our homes, you know? you'll see newscasters broadcasting out of their homes and their kid walks in. So really the technology does make it so everyone can basically bring a meeting from anywhere. Um, so I, I do love the idea of, you know, keeping those, those secondary venues or keeping those outside venues as an option. I think, you know, we've talked a lot about the technology and the Wi-Fi and, and the physical infrastructure, but I think the, the main component really is what that makes it happen is the people and having the people with the right skill set to be able to, to bring this in terms of the creativity that's needed to shift over and include everyone in you know, the hybrid meetings as well as the people who, who know how to run the technology. And I think having something as simple as, you know, are your MCs prepared to how to engage a virtual audience. Are they gonna, you know, speak out to the people who are attending virtually as well as the people who are in the meeting rooms? Are, you know, are they gonna make people have that feeling? I think the people are just as much an important uh, aspect as having good Wi-Fi. Yeah, very much so. So then how long do you think hybrid carries us? Forever? One year, three years, five years, 10 years? You know, I mean, do, do you think this is just, boom, we're gonna make a change? this is the way it's going to be forever and it's going to push forward. You know, we're not Nostradamus, but, you know, understanding that we don't know what the next five years looks like. Um, do we just plan on, you know, hey, this is the way it is going forward? I think it completely depends on the clients. I mean, 
I had expected 10 years ago, virtual to have been the, the norm with everything, even pre-pandemic. I thought where we were 10 years ago, that we would have a live streaming component to all of our events. And we really didn't. So I think that you'll have clients that really need to get people together and that's what they want. And they want an intimate in-person meeting. And then you'll have other clients who maybe rely heavily on fundraising, who want a larger audience, who need to have that reach to, to, to create more sponsorship opportunities that will, but the wonderful thing is that they have the option now and really good options. Um, so I don't think you see it going anywhere. I think it will be an added on component to certain types of meetings. Got it. Okay. Agreed. And I think there are certain things that really you just can't replace face to face. Like I don't see incentive trips being replaced by hybrid events. No one wants to pretend that they're in Hawaii while they're sitting in their living room in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, there's definitely there, just like Lynn said, having the option. This is just another tool we've added to our tool belt. This was something that was unexpected when the pandemic started. No one thought they would have to learn this. But now that they have it, it's such a valuable tool. And hybrid is so fun. It's been fun to kind of come back and start rethinking live experiences. But, you know, David Stark said at the beginning of this, like, you know, obviously the pandemic was awful, but. Who would have ever thought we would have had had a year to go away and think about our businesses and the way we wanted our businesses and to work on a product for our businesses that just is an added piece in the toolbox. So in some ways it was a blessing for the events industry. Um, you know, in many ways it was bad. Obviously it was from a financial standpoint for many vendors, but I'm just so proud of our industry for, for pushing through and persevering and, um, and really working hard on this next level of, uh, of attendee engagement. I think it's going to be an amazing you know, future yeah, for us. For sure. Absolutely. I do think hybrid is going to, at least for the next few years, going to remain an option. And it's going to come down to budgets. I think, uh, you know, companies, especially, you know, with internal um, companies are going to sit down with a budget and say, you know, okay, we've been doing hybrid events. Does this make sense to continue or to, you know, separate the two? So I think at least for the next few years, we'll see that and there'll be some decisions made, you know, after that. Yeah. But I also, if I can add one more point, I, yeah. I do see pricing coming down on technology. I yeah. mean, pieces of equipment like StreamYard or where we can go in, purchase a subscription to something that's $5,000 for the year. And then you can do as many events as you want and you don't necessarily have to have a whole big virtual team on the other end. So I do think pricing will adjust and we can just add it in as a line item like we would do a photo booth going forward. Yeah. Oh, I agree, Lynn. And I think options will get bigger too as more people dive into this new market. Um, if we right. do see some of those alternative businesses getting into this, we'll see a, a lot of different options as well. Oh, we've already seen that. I mean, how many different yeah. demos have you done for different virtual platforms or different you know, production tools? Um, I think hybrid events will look different in the future, but I think they'll definitely be around. I think a company that doesn't uh, take advantage of adding some kind of hybrid component to their events will now be losing out on either an audience or losing out on opportunities for kind of increasing their reach. Yeah. So whether it's the entire event is going to be virtual and on site and hybrid, or whether it's going to be different components of it that can kind of have op other opportunities for engagement. I definitely think if anything, it'll just, it'll give us more options in the future. Very be interesting to revisit this conversation a year from now <laughs> see how many how many <laughs> like, we had no like. idea what we were talking about who knew <laughs> one or two ways <laughs> hey you i know. did i'm i'm looking to buy a car and i did a virtual tour uh, you know a 360 ai tour of the car who would have thought that's what i'd be doing recently you know instead of a test drive so we have there's so much that's coming up that we're going to be really excited and surprised about. And I think as long as we keep our eyes open, I mean, meeting planners, we're known for being creative and for pivoting. It's, it's what we do. So I don't see it. I don't see it uh, ending anytime soon. Yes. You may not be figuring out how to get a giraffe to the event so that they can bring it on stage while a motorcycle jumps across the flaming, the flaming ring of fire. Wait, you were at my event last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, ladies, thank you so much. Joe, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Last, last words real quick. Let's just go around. We'll start with Sarah. 
your your final thoughts on hybrid and what it's going to be, what we should look for going forward over the next 12 months? Um, know what your goals are for your event and what can be converted to virtual and what can't. Don't try to force something uh, and try to take advantage of all the different options that you have in terms of platform, production, and engagement. Awesome. Tiffany? I would say even before jumping into an event, uh, doing the research and polling your audience, making sure that they are comfortable and ready to move on to the hybrid position, um, and then going from there. Very cool. Lynn? Yeah, and I think, you know, hybrid events are here to stay. I mean, it means more sponsors, more audience engagement, you know, greater ROI for your for your people, but you do have to really um, talk to your client and make sure the goals are clear uh, from the onset. Um, so you, you know what level of service to sort of give them. Love that. Joe, your thoughts? Um, I would say because we're in the wild west of hybrid events, you know, be looking for those innovators. Look for those guys that, that uh, or gals that are, that are uh, coming up with new ideas and, and turning it on its head. You know, I think there's a lot out there that we haven't even thought of yet. And somebody's going to show its face and, and uh, we're going to be able to do really, really cool things with a lot of people involved. For sure. I know for me, even just listening to you guys talk about this stuff, like my mind has been completely expanded in what is possible and what's considered hybrid. Because I had like this picture of like four different things and I'm like, well, it's this, 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 or this, and that's it. And then Sarah, you're like, well, you could do it this way and this way and this way. And I was like, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about that. I didn't think. And so um, huge help for me just to better understand where we're going, what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to steal some of the things that you said, Sarah. I'm just going to tell you right now. I've got a, tr- I've got a training with a bunch of meeting planners in July that we're going to be uh, down at the special event in Miami. And I'm actually doing a whole thing where we're going to do a whole session on talking about hybrid, what to do with it, how to do it, and then helping to get people better prepared for it. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'll credit you. Don't worry. Well, the good news is I'm free in July, so I'm happy to pop down to Miami and join you. <laughs> okay, copy that. Hey, we'll see. You Pretty hot. Um, well, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everything. You guys are awesome. I apologize we ran over again, uh, but it's a lot of fun, and uh, all of you guys are rock stars in my book, and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Jordan. Jordan. Thank you, guys. Have a great Thanks. afternoon. You too. No matter your opinion of hybrid, it's here to stay. So remember, if you can't do anything about it, don't whine, don't complain, get out there and learn. Know more today and more tomorrow than you did yesterday so that you can be better informed for your clients, your customers, and your colleagues. Stay up on all the most recent information, find people that know what they're talking about, and go after it because your next gig had better be better than your last. You're great professionals. I believe in you. And I know that next time you'll be more gig ready. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. 